Bal Chanta, uh, Department of uh, Condensed Matter Physics and Material Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, and his team members and all our students to the two days webinar and the virtual visit of Tiffer Labs. PG Department of Physics, Kanya Mahavidale Jalandar, organizes such an interesting and informative seminars annually and also arranges ed educational trips to reputed institutions like CSIR, Mohali, Gujarat, Borosil, Gujarat, then the Central Institute of Plastic Engineering and Technology, Saipet, Amritsar, etc. But due to pandemic conditions, for the first time, DPD sponsored webinars and the virtual visits to lab has been organized. So first of all, let me give you an in introduction about the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, grants. Department of Biotechnology started the Star College Scheme in 2008 to support colleges and universities offering undergraduate in, uh, education to improve science teaching across the country. DBT identify colleges with ambition and potential for excellence and provide physical infrastructure for achieving excellence in teaching and unique exposure of students to experimental science. There are only 29 colleges in uh, India, only three colleges in Punjab, having DPT star status, and KMV is the only woman institute of Punjab decorated with star status grant. Here I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Dr. Venu Gopal Ajanta for accepting our invitation and sparing precious time from his busy schedule to give his valuable informative talk for our students and also arranging virtual visit to his labs. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Dr. Venugopal Chanta is currently working as professor at the uh, Department of Condensed Matter Physics and Material Science, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. His research interests are polaritron dynamics, plasmon mediated enhancement in optical properties, dielectric nanostructures for uh, photonic applications, photonic crystal microcavities with quantum dot defects. He has published more than 120 research papers and has got more than 2,500 citations for his publications. He has undertaken three major projects with the total budget of about uh, rupees 900 lakhs in Tifa, Mumbai, and nine external projects funded by NICT Japan, UKIERI, Swedish Research Council, DST, with the total budget of about uh, 1 million USD. He has represented India in the first BRICS Photonics Working Group meeting held in Moscow in March 2018. He has delivered more than 100 invited talks in national and international conferences, universities, and institutes from around the world. He has got so many achievements in his credit due to time constraint. I have presented very few of them. Uh, here, I would also uh, like to uh, welcome faculty members, those who have joined us from different institutions. Uh, we acknowledge the presence of uh, Ms. Manpreet Kaur uh, from DCM Presidency School, Ludhiana, along with her students, Maskeen Kaur, Jasleen Kaur, Pratham Bansal, uh, Ms. Tarun uh, Aroda, Bhartiya Vidya Mandir, Senior Secondary School. Uh, with this, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear teachers, for uh, uh, joining us. And now, without any further delay, I request Professor Dr. Vinayakupal Ajanta to enlighten our students with his valuable talk. So, please. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. It, it's nice to be with the students again. So, um, I'll be um, talking about uh, um, introduction to optical spectroscopy. Uh, so. Uh, the books which are uh, really good for the students to follow are uh, uh, these two, uh, which I would highly recommend. So one is uh, Laser Spectroscopy, the Basic Concepts and Instrumentation by Demtroder. And the second one is Nonlinear Optics by either Shen or Blombergen or uh, Robert Boyd. So any book on nonlinear non -linear optics will be very useful for uh, understanding the spectroscopic uh, techniques as well. Right, so I'll try to cover um, what are uh, needed for doing spectroscopy. For example, starting with the light source, what kind of light sources we use to excite our samples. Then we, uh, I mean, we'll go through some measurement techniques and then uh, light detectors. So we need to measure the light which is scattered or reflected or transmitted. So we use different kinds of detectors. 
and uh, yeah so as i said like so we'll look at different uh, types of spectroscopies and what they are useful for okay so um, when we start with the um, when, when we start with a very basic thing like so when we look at the sample light is instant at an angle theta right so this is the normal and with respect to the normal light is instant at an angle some part of it gets reflected some part gets transmitted and some part may get scattered and in addition to reflection and transmission we can also have uh, absorption inside the sample in addition to these reflection transmission scattering and absorption you can also have nonlinear interaction of incident light with your sample okay so how do you explain this so if you have light incident on on a sample so the light is an electromagnetic field which means it has certain electric and magnetic field components so the magnetic field component is generally very uh, weak so we talk about the electric field component influence of the electric field component on the sample right so how do you explain that so you talk in terms of what is known as polarizability the p is the susceptibility right the susceptibility is the property of the material and e is the applied electric field uh, which light is possessing so the incident light field interacts with the 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 medium and the interaction is given by this chi dot e the susceptibility times electric field which is measured in term in terms of the polarizability but this susceptibility the property of the material how it responds to an incident electric field incident light field is not linear right this is not the, the first term is not the only solution this is the first order component chi 1 times the electric field e power 1 right so in addition to this this is a uh, tensor so if you expand it like so what you see is you have higher order terms which are coming in so if you have a high intense electric field for example if you have a high intense laser beam falling on your sample this e squared e q o b power for all these terms will co will contribute to the susceptibility right so now this susceptibility will lead to the what we measure as the polarizability of the uh, the response of the material right so at higher incident powers the higher order nonlinear terms the sky 2 chi 3 terms will come in so it's just not the linear electric field of the light which is going to uh, respond to your uh, um, or help modulate your light uh, the material properties but the higher order uh, material properties like the chi 2 chi 3 are also going to affect your uh, the response of medium to the um, incident electric field so a way to understand this is if we if a light is incident on the sample right so the electric field is going to excite electrons in, inside your medium so these excited electrons will create holes in the for example in the pitagorean semiconductor we have valence band and conduction band so the electron is excited from valence band to the conduction band so you have an electron and a hole a negative and a positive charge right so when you have a negative and a positive charge you are exciting a dipole so inside your medium when light is absorbed when your electrons are excited to excited level so you have an electron and a hole pair or a, or a dipole which is uh, excited in your medium Right. So, if your these dipoles, which are uh, excited in the medium, are in turn going to affect the incident light field, so and that modified light field is going to affect your dipoles further. So, this interaction between the excited dipoles and the incident light field is going to define how the light and the matter interact with each other. Right. So, that is what is explained in the susceptibility term. So, chi one e one or uh, chi 1 e chi 2 the second order susceptibility times e squared and all that right so these lead to different processes nonlinear processes which we will not go into uh, uh, immediately like so um, these are called some sum and difference frequency you can generate different colors you put like two blue um, color beams and then you can generate red or you can put two red and then you can generate blue or you can put two different colors and generate a a third different color out of your material 
So these are different processes which are possible because of the nonlinear interaction. So the reflection, transmission, scattering. Um, okay, uh, I hope I'm audible because some message came that I'm muted. Okay, um, so in addition to these uh, reflection, transmission, absorption, and scattering, which are, which could be linear uh, response of the medium, so you can also have nonlinear interaction if you have an intense laser beam interacting with a sample. Okay. So that's because of this nonlinear uh, response of the medium. Now, if you look at absorption or emission, Right. So when when a photon is incident with certain energy H nu, which corresponds to this excited state E2 minus uh, the ground state E1. So E2 minus E1 is the energy of the photon, then the photon can excite an electron from ground state to the excited state. So these excited electron, it recombines with the hole and emits the same energy photon of H nu. So this is called a radiative process because the radiation a, a, a emission is happening. So it's called a radiative process. There are also non-radiative processes where the excited electron, right? It can basically uh, interact with the phonons, the lattice vibrations inside your sample and lose the energy, excess energy and slowly come from excited state to the ground state. So for example, in molecules, if this is like an atom. An atom has clear two level systems. But if you go to molecules where you're bringing many, many atoms together, each of these atoms, uh, they interact with each other and you start forming bands. So you no longer may have single uh, energy levels which are separated by some gap, but you'll have many, many energy levels in between. So if you have closely spaced energy levels, the electron which is excited can lose uh, energy by scattering with the phonons, but the lattice vibrations of your uh, molecule or, the, uh, or your crystal, and then it can come down to the ground state, in which case that no photon is emitted. So there won't be any emission. Right? We, the, what is a emission? Emission is basically photoluminescence, fluorescence, right? or uh, phosphorescence, depending on how fast the emission comes out. So you may have uh, a the color of the uh, photon or the energy of the photon could be smaller than the energy of the photon which is exciting them because there will be some loss within the um, phonon interaction. So some energy is lost to the lattice vibrations and then the an, a photon of energy smaller than the excited energy level difference will be emitted. So this will be H nu 2 which will be smaller than H nu. So in case of uh, um, this process absorption and emission, you have spontaneous and stimulated emissions. Right? So if you have, for example, another level uh, which is on top, so you can um, excite like you can put a small weak uh, beam uh, which is exciting between E2 and D3 and then you can have a stimulated emission. So it forces the emission between E3 to E1 or E3 to E2 just because of the presence of a small um, beam which is instead. So this is called a simulated. And when you excite and then the emission happens by itself, it's a spontaneous emission. So what we typically measure are the spectral, spectra of this, like absorption spectrum or reflection spectrum or transmission spectrum. So in the spectral measurements, right? So we need different set of instruments. First, we need to shine light. So for that, we need light source. Then we have a sample and then some part is reflected or some part is transmitted or emitted. So we need to measure the spectrum. So how do you measure the spectrum? We'll look at it briefly in the next few slides. And then eventually like we need a detector also. Another uh, set of measurements which may not involve spectra, but you, you measure the change in the reflection or the change in the transmission. For example, there is you can put a an intense or a strong beam, a high power light uh, on the sample, and then you put a, a weaker light beam on, on to the sample. Now, if you, if you can vary the difference, so with and without this strong beam, which is the pump beam, you can measure like what is the change in the reflection, transmission, absorption of the weak beam. Right? 
so that shows like what is the effect of both linear or non-linear effect of the incident strong pump beam on your uh, weak pump beam so that is called the differential reflection so the reflection with and without the pump beam is measured similarly in the differential transmission the transmitted uh, intensity of the weak probe beam with and without the pump beam is measured so that's a differential transmission right it has certain advantage advantages so i'll show that in the uh, later on but first to measure the spectra we use either a spectrograph or the so-called monochromator how does it work you have an incident beam which is coming at this input port at the top okay. so there is a mirror which sends the uh, light to this curved mirror for example okay so this curved mirror it diverges the light and then make sure it the uh, large part of the grating is um, illuminated right and this grating the central grating will disperse the light into different colors okay so from violet indigo blue green to red so and then they fall on a another curved mirror which collimate which make these beams go parallel to each other right so this is the incident beam which is for example focused here which is diverging i have not shown but it is diverging here and this curved mirror will make it it's like a lens so if you if you're out of focus like so what happens is if you are away from the focal length so it's it's going to expand the beam right so that's what happens so that like it covers a large portion of the some of the grating here which is at the center so this grating is dispersing the <clears throat> broadband light i showed it as a white light white light has vgr seven colors with violet to red so they split into different uh, directions because of the dispersion and then so this curved mirror again it acts like a um, it, it's a, a concave mirror for example so it collimates this diverging beam so that you get parallel rays of different colors right now you put another mirror and send it through this output port so the difference between a spectrograph and monochromator is only in what you put at the output port. If you put a CCD, a charge coupled device, which is a array of uh, pixels, okay, like like in we all use a CCD in our mobile phones now, right? So um, it, it's similar to that. So what you do is like in in single shot you can measure the spectrum, okay, whatever is falling on falling here. So the entire spectrum is detected on the CCD. So each pixel, so for example, there are row of pixels here, second row, third row, fourth row, like that, like so many, many rows of these pixels. So each row corresponds to one single color and color of light means like so wavelength. So each row of pixels will tell you what is the wavelength, the intensity of the wavelength. You integrate all the light or the intensity of the uh, electrons which are generated because of this incident light. On, the, on your CCD, so this color. So if you integrate the intensity of the signal on, on this pixel, it gives the blue color uh, light which is falling. Amount of light, blue color light which is falling on the CCD is given by that. So that tells you how much blue component is there in your spectrum. So in case if you put a very broad band light, okay? So for example, if you put a, um, a broad band source, So this one will be so the x-axis here is the wavelength and y-axis is intensity so this is my incident intensity when some part of the light one some part of the spectrum is absorbed so then your absorption spectrum will look like So this part of the wavelength is absorbed in, inside your sample. So the absorbed, the transmitted sample, for example, is, is sent, transmitted signal from your sample is sent through the spectrometer, right? So this is the incident spectrum on the, the top one is the incident spectrum on the sample and the bottom one is the 
absorption spectrum of the white light which is incident which is transmitted through your sample after absorption and reflection okay so the absorption is measured by measuring the spectrum in in, in this case okay. so how do you detect the light so one thing i showed is a ccd okay so i didn't mention so a monochromator in case of spectros spectrograph you use a ccd but in case in case of a monochromator you put a uh, a narrow slit okay so you can vary the position of the slit so that like you can either detect the blue light or the green light or the red light only a very narrow bandwidth is measured okay and then you put something known as a point detector for example you put a photodiode a small photodiode uh, at, at one of these uh, at the output port which is uh, something like this okay so you have a small port you don't have a ccd but you use this one single pixel detector right and then you will be measuring only whatever is coming out through this um, port here output port a, a small yes, please, screen sir. yes please the screen is not visible can you please share it again Yes, sir. Now it's fine. Thank okay. you. Great. So I don't know from when it was lost. So, uh, so what I said is like so there is a broadband spectrum, like which is shown at the top here, and then there's the bottom spectrum is after it is after the sample uh, absorbs certain bit. So for example, there is a dip in the spectrum. So this part of the spectrum is absorbed. So You'll, that intensity in the spectrum will reduce. So the x-axis is wavelength, and y-axis is intensity. Right. So that's what we are measuring. So we put this light. So for example, this entire light, we don't know what it consists of. The transmitted light from the sample is sent to the spectrometer. It goes through the spectrometer, and then you put either a CCD, which gives you the full spectrum, or in case of a monochromator, you have a small slit here. And you put a detector like a photomultiplier tube or a photodiode, which measures the intensity of the single color which is falling out of this. So you can move this, for example, to this position. So instead of blue light component, you measure the green light component. Okay. So by by reducing the width of this, you can reduce, you can get very high resolution in your spectrum. Okay. So that's the difference between in a case of a spectrograph. You get a single shot CCD. The CCD will measure the complete spectrum with the array of pixels. In case of a spectrum, in case of a monochromator, you use a single uh, pixel detector like a photodiode or a PMT. Okay. So the light detectors we use, for example, thermal detectors called the pyrometers. So they measure the heat which is generated by the intensity of light which is falling on them. In case of photodiodes, we can measure the voltage output or the current output, and you can have these uh, fast photodiodes whose uh, signal like uh, response is very, very fast. Okay. So light is incident, electrons are generated very fast. Okay. So you can extract the current out of it or measure the voltage out of it, and then you can measure your how fast your signal is coming. Right. And then you can also use high sensitive uh, diodes like avalanche photodiodes, which will give you even for as low as like a single photon falling on them will give you a pulse output so that you can measure very, very low intensity lights using this. Right? Other one which I said like putting the used are the CCDs in spectrometers. So you can also have photocathodes, photocells, photomultipliers or the photoelectric Im image intensifiers. All these are different kinds of detectors which are used in spectroscopy. So you can also have different detection techniques and uh, electronics. For example, if you are using an avalanche photodiode, you use photon counting, box star integrator, or optical oscilloscopes. All these are different techniques used for measuring your number of photons. Okay. So the light sources which we use, they can vary from very simple halogen lamp source. What you can get in the market for say five rupees or 10 rupees, you can use them to excite a broadband source like the one which I showed here. So this broadband source covering from say 
400 nanometer, 2000 nanometer, or even up to 2000 nanometer is possible just with a 5 rupee halogen lamp. Okay. So you can use that to measure the spectral response, or you can use expensive sources, but with the higher uh, um, characteristics or better characteristics, for example, for different applications. For example, lasers, single mode lasers, you can precisely excite with one single um, wavelength. Or you can have tunable lasers where we can tune the uh, laser wavelength, the color of the light. I'll show a couple of them uh, tomorrow in the lab. And also like pulse lasers where you can get like really short pulses in time. Right? So this can be as small as like few femtoseconds now. Five femtosecond lasers are easily available nowadays. Right? So why do you need pulse lasers? So for example, you want to measure the lifetime. The spectral information tells you where the carriers, where the energy levels are and how uh, how well they are separated. This is the information which you can get from the spectral measurements. But then how these excited electrons are coming down to the ground state, how they are decaying down to the ground state, what processes are involved in it. So that can all be studied if you measure the lifetime. Okay, As a function of time, if you study how the intensity of the signal is dropping, from that, like we can estimate lots of physics out of it, lot of, about the different processes which are happening in, in the system. Right. So, um, so the lifetime um, for lifetime measurements, like so, we we need to uh, use these pulse lasers. Right. So we excite. It's like a delta function. It's exciting at t equal to zero, and after t equal to zero, how the signal is evolving is what we measure from the lifetime measurements. We can have like spontaneous induced, as I said, like radiative or non-radiative. Non-radiative means like, so there are phonon interactions. Energy of the excited electron is not coming out in the photon, but it's going as heat in the sample, for example, if it is phonon mediated. Okay. So for example, collision induced uh, uh, non-radiative things in, in gas molecules or uh, in solids, like it's mostly the phonons uh, which contribute to this non-radiative process. So if you look at what happens in low dimensions, right? So um, I'll, there's something called excitons. We know about electrons and the holes. We know valence band and conduction band. In the valence band is the highest field uh, band. And then the conduction band is a band above that with a band gap between them. This is for semiconductors. And now, if you are exciting an electron to the excited state in the conduction band, so the electron here, which has a negative charge and the hole which is formed in your valence band. So these two form a bond pair, like a hydrogen atom. Right. So one electron and, uh, and the nucleus, like so, like that, like you'll have a um, negatively charged electron in the connection band and positively charged hole in the valence band. This, those two form a bond pair called an exciton. Okay. So depending on the separation between them, right, how far they can be, they're divided into Mott Vanier exciton and Frenkel exciton. These are just names. Let's not worry about what they are. But basically, these are bound electron hole pairs, which can exist in solids or in, or in uh, different molecules. Right. So why are these excitons important? So if you go to low dimensional structures, right. So what is a low dimensional set, structure? Um, it, it's basically if you have a bulk material, like a piece of silicon. So the electron can move in all X, Y, and Z directions. On the other hand, if you make the structure in such a way that electrons are confined in one direction, like there is a potential well, what we study in quantum mechanics. So there is a potential well, um, which is formed so that electron uh, will see this potential, these walls, these barriers. Okay, in, in the X direction, if it is, if it wants to move in this direction, it sees these barriers and then it cannot, it, it will have quantized energy levels. Okay. But if, you, if it wants to move in this direction or in this direction, it can easily move. Okay. So, it, so what it means is like we can have a potential well, a quantum well, which is a one dimensional system in which electron uh, can uh, move freely in two dimensions but in the third dimension is confined so that like you have quantized energy levels. Similarly, you can have a quantum wire 
in which electrons are free to move along this direction but when it goes this direction or this direction so it sees this potential uh, barriers like which we uh, just talked about and quantum dots are like particle in a box where the electron is confined in all three directions so your ex ey ez and kx ky kz the energy and momentum in all three dimensions are quantized so then you see a particle in a box or a quantum dot okay. so when you have these systems right so the semiconductor fabrication techniques have made these low dimensional structures possible in chemistry also like people uh, synthesize these nanoparticles to make these quantum dots or the so called quantum disks which are like uh, um, like pseudo quantum wells so in these systems the density of states right so how many electrons can stay in each level right how many energy levels are there so all these will get modified right and then because of this potential well so the electron and hole so the electron which is excited here it cannot go out of this barrier because its energy level um, it is high for it to overcome so it's going to get confined within this region so which means the electron and hole which are in the connection and uh, connection and the valence band so they are going to confine within this small uh, potential well region so when the negative and positive charges of electron and hole are close together then the probability of finding them as a bound pair will increase so the excitons are more possible more probable in uh, quantum confined structures or low dimensional structures so once these are close together then the carrier carrier interactions how electrons are scattering with other electrons how electron is interacting with other holes in the neighborhood so all these things are going to get modified right so these are interesting and uh, um, problems which which people study Excuse me, sir. Hello, Dr. Paul. Yes. Uh, yes, now voice is clear. In between, like you have... in... Maybe yeah, in between it, it looks like you lost me. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so I, I was showing these density of states. So in, uh, the density of states goes as e power half in bulk, e power zero in quantum well, e power minus half in the quantum wire, and then in the quantum dots particle in a box, like you'll have delta function like density of states, very discrete energy levels. So the quantum dot is like a atom in a in a solid state system. Right. So the excitons. Uh, there are two ways so you have coherent excitons or incoherent excitons i'm telling these things so that like you'll understand how light interacts with the matter so when light is incident on your sample on your semiconductor sample for example and it has certain polarization okay a polarized light is falling on your sample so the electrons are excited from valence band to the conduction band right so because these are uh, confined to smaller dimensions so the electron and hole form a bound pair called exciton so now all these excitons initially because your incident light is polarized along say one of the directions which is vertical polarization okay so all the electrons will be aligned in the all the dipoles will be aligned in the um, direction of the polarization of your incident light so that's shown at the right bottom here so these are the coherent excitons whose polarization is aligned with respect to that of the incident light polarization but if you have non resonant excitation so here we are resonantly exciting from valence band to the conduction band right so here if you take the parabolic band so this is the parabola and this is another um, parabola which is shown here so from the valence band light light line is this h nu or h uh, h cross is equal to ck so you have light line which is coming here so this is momentum and this is energy 
right so this, this is a, called the dispersion plot energy versus dispersion is called energy versus momentum plot is called the dispersion plot so in this light has certain momentum and it's going to excite an electron from this position here the green dot here to the a dot uh, here okay so this um, uh, electron and hole they form a bond pair and form the excitons which are slight, slightly um, because of their binding energy they are slightly lower energy compared to the free electrons which are inside the material now the interesting point is if you are exciting not at the band edges for example from one energy level to another energy level but you are exciting to very high up in the band right so then what happens is your instant light is exciting a valence band electron to conduction band electron high up in the band so then there is phonon interactions and then energy is lost and then it comes to the band edge which is uh, for example in this case like so the electron loses energy and comes to the band edge and then forms a bond pair with the hole right in this case there is a time between the excitation of the electron and when the exciton is formed so by the time exciton is formed all the electrons lost their coherence they are they are randomly oriented polarizations right so these are the so called incoherent excitons so by studying either resonant excitation or non resonant excitation you can look at how the excitons interact with excitons in coherent domain or in the incoherent domain so it depends on the time scale so if you have a time resolution we can easily study these processes okay. so that's what is shown little more detail here so if you have a hole i mean electron from the valence band is excited to the uh, conduction band so the conduction band initially loses uh, i mean uh, randomizes its momentum right and then uh, loses energy slowly by phonon interaction comes to the bandage and forms the exciton okay so this is the relaxation process which is well known now because people have studied the time resolved measurements so there are three time scales which are involved so the first time scale is how fast this coherence the polarization of the excitons or electrons is going to get lost to this incoherent exciton regime incoherent electron regime so all the polarizations are aligned in one direction and over certain time they are all becoming randomly oriented because they are scattering with each other okay this scattering is going to randomize your um, polarization so the first time scale the fastest time scale is the dephasing time the second one is called the energy relaxation time where energy is lost and then recombination time where basically the electron is going to recombine with the hole and emit a photon out like the emission which we see the fluorescence which we see from the sample okay. so the carriers interact with each other the electrons interact with electrons excitons will interact with excitons electrons interact with excitons electrons interact with phonons all these combinations are possible and we can do very precise spectroscopic measurements to study how how efficiently they interact with each other right these are interesting because from basic physics we want to understand the physics and the second thing is from device point of view we can uh, uh, design new kinds of devices if we understand what is happening so typically the relaxation times are related by this expression 1 over t2 is equal to 1 over t1 plus 1 by t2 star so t2 star is the pure dephasing time even is the population decay time okay. so how to estimate lifetime so there is one way is to use electronics if you have very fast camera right so we can use the shutter to basically switch on and off and can measure like how fast the um, signal is coming okay but the fastest electronics one can get now gives a resolution of about 2 picosecond so this is called the streak camera which helps in measuring uh, time scales of 2 picosecond okay. if you want to study even faster time scales then you don't have any way to measure it using electronics the only way is to use this ultra fast spectroscopy okay so we use ultra fast spectroscopy because ultra fast spectroscopy can measure lifetimes or the time scales which are only limited by the pulse width and the pulse width shortest pulse width we can get now is 5 femtosecond so 1000 times faster 
time resolution can be obtained if you go to optical measurements instead of using electrical uh, or the present day electronics okay so for this you need ultra fast lasers you may read if you're interested about mode locking and cue switching how pulses are generated inside your lasers so you can get up like a few femtoseconds one to five femtoseconds are all possible nowadays okay so here the measurements are only limited by the laser pulse width and so like you can go down to time scales of few femtoseconds by using ultra fast spectroscopy so there is a relation between um, so for example uncertainty principle says uh, that delta nu delta t product is greater than h h by 2 right we all know this so what this means is if we know if we measure delta nu in spectrum if you measure the spectrum right so for example we have seen an example like this so we have seen an example of absorption spectrum like this so what is the absorption band absorption band is the width of this dip which you are seeing in the spectrum okay so again the x axis is the wavelength color of light or frequency and the y axis is the intensity of the light so the dip in the transmission spectrum means that this part is absorbed so the dip is absorbed inside your sample and the width of the dip will tell you like what is the line width or what is the bandwidth of your um, of your uh, sample of this particular resonance right so this bandwidth is related to the lifetime of your um, process right so because delta nu delta t are related by the uncertainty principle so once you know the delta nu you can estimate what is the lifetime or or how much time the electrons are taking to decay down to the ground state right so either by measuring the delta nu or by measuring the delta tau in in actual real time you can estimate the lifetime of your uh, electrons or or excited carriers so there are two types of line broadening one is called the homogeneous which is given by a lorentzian line shape and the inhomogeneous broadening which is given by the gaussian line shape right so these are finer details but the main point is between by measuring either delta nu or delta tau you can get information about the other component because they are related to uncertainty principle you can do either spectral measurement or you can do lifetime measurement to get the similar information okay there are some pros and cons but this is all. so if you want to do in the time resolution time resolved measurements so there's something like non linear processes i mentioned so one is one of them is the four wave mixing technique so in which we put two uh, beams of say frequency omega okay so omega 1 omega 1 and then there is one more third beam which is coming of also of omega 1 then they, these three will generate or if for general purposes like you can take this as omega 1 this as omega 2 the third one as omega 3 so then the signal generated will be omega 4 of a different frequency or different color of light comes out so with the relation between omega 1 plus omega 2 uh, minus omega 3 will be the omega 4 okay so that's how the relation is which you can work out from the the chi 2 or chi 3 um, process like so from the susceptibility or the polarizability term you can measure you can estimate what color of light comes out of this so this can be used to measure the the so called t2 or the defacing time okay right? so when two beams are incident on your sample so the two beams interfere so we have you have studied interference pattern right interference phenomena so when two light beams uh, uh, are coincident so they form an interference pattern so that interference pattern depends on right on the coherence uh, of length of your uh, light source so if you are um, if you have very short coherence time like a white led uh, room light so it's very difficult to measure this interference pattern but if you have laser source with large coherence time it's much easier to measure so similarly if you have a coherence time within this coherence time you can find a grating 
the interference pattern is formed which leads to scattering of one of the beams it's like a grating diffracts one of these components this laser beam is diffracted in this direction so by measuring the uh, this signal uh, which is in the dashed line as a function of time so we can measure the dephasing time right so you can also measure what is known as non-linear photoluminescence or non-linear fluorescence in which so this is typical uh, setup what we do is like we have a laser source which is split into two parts one goes through this and the other goes through the second part here so these two beams they are focused simultaneously onto your sample and what we measure is this is this is a signal this is you chop you modulate the uh, two frequencies at which these uh, beams are coming two beams are coming onto your sample right so and then you measure like with and without the two beams like so what is the uh, difference in the signal right in what we think of is like if the i1 intensity is falling through this beam and i2 intensity is falling through this beam and the signal which is generated by this is say um, l1 and l2 are the two signals from these two beams when both the beams are present we expect like l1 plus l2 is the total signal which is generated right so but that doesn't happen some sometimes we may have more signal sometimes we may have less signal than the then i mean when both the beams are present we may have less than two times or more than two times the signal which is possible depending on the non-linear response of the medium right? so if we have for example um, more uh, intensity than what is uh, present so this is for example uh, single beam and this is for example the double beam so the difference between them <clears throat> will tell you like if it is saturation so we are exciting all the levels in our upper state are excited so then what happens is even if you have put more intensity of light these upper states are filled the density of states are not available for electrons to go to the excited state so then no no more electron can be excited to the excited state so all this additional light which is falling is of no use right it, it just transmits without getting absorbed because all the energy levels in the excited state are filled so that's uh, saturated so then you get a signal which is negative right so sometimes what happens is this energy level basically um, broadens so they are too closely spaced or there is some interaction which causes this broadening of this energy level which means more number of density of states more number of energy levels closely spaced energy levels which are possible so in which case more and more uh, electrons can broaden but they are occupying a band of these energies instead of one single energy level so that leads to broadening or sometimes this energy level can shift so depending on the process saturation or broadening or energy shift you can have different signal shapes so that the signal of the nonlinear photoluminescence is so it comes from either a negative or a double dip or a positive and a negative kind of thing so depending on the shape of these signals we can find out what mechanism is going is happening in your uh, sample so you can use this for real measurements right so the one thing i mentioned uh, initially is a pump probe measurement so as i said like so there is a strong pump beam which is formed and then there is a weak probe beam which is delayed with respect to this pump beam right so in presence of the pump beam you measure what is the probe beam uh, transmitted signal or reflected signal or the emission signal right? and um, with respect to the delay between this pump and probe uh, times right you have two pulses which are coming in right there's a pump pulse and a probe pulse you delay the time between them either they can come at the same time or pump comes before okay and then probe comes at different times after the pump and then you measure like what is the change in the probe transmitted intensity or the reflected intensity right? so that gives you the time resolved uh, transmission measurement uh, information right? so similar thing can also be done for the so called uh, uh, fluorescence subconversion or uh, photoluminescence subconversion so in this case you have a
right so so what we're doing is there is a laser beam which is coming in right and uh, it's excited on the sample the sample is emitting emitting this uh, photoluminescence or the fluorescence signal now you put this fluorescence signal of omega pl frequency and the omega laser frequency photons on on a nonlinear crystal it has a chi2 process which generates a sum of these two frequencies okay so if you have red and red so it will give you a blue light output okay so that's omega pl plus omega laser so which you can put it to a spectrometer to measure whether it's what what color is coming out or you do a difference between the time delay between these two okay so as i showed here sorry. so we are changing the time delay so initially the laser is falling uh, at a fixed time okay and and then like what you do is like you are getting some photoluminescence signal now what you do is like you vary the slowly vary the time at which this laser pulse is reference pulse is coming so the reference pulse intensity is fixed but the laser uh, but the fluorescence signal is changing as a function of time which is shown by this exponential decay here right so then depending on the intensity of the fluorescence signal your blue light signal intensity will change so this mimics the fluorescence signal because intensity of your short pulse or the re reference pulse is fixed so by mixing at each position of the delay you can generate like this this spectrum here yes somebody raised their hand i'll be uh, just two minutes i'll i'll stop then we can take the questions right so this is how the signal looks like so we can measure um, basically the exciton uh, uh, decay times in, in this case or the electron uh, different processes are possible uh, by by these measurements right so this is uh, the main uh, point for any time resolved measurements is like you have something called a delay line so the delay line is basically i'll i'll show tomorrow so you split the there are pulses which are coming out of this uh, uh, laser okay so some 80 million pulses are coming out of this pulse uh, out of this laser for sec for a second and out of this like say you send like 40 million through this and 40 million through this you are doing 50 50 beam splitting and then what you do is this set of pulse strengths you delay with a, so that means that the length of the path which is which this beam takes the first beam takes and the length of the path which the second beam takes uh, is made to be different right so you can make one pulse strain to come before or after the second uh, pulse strain okay so that's how you create the difference in the time delay between the uh, the pump and the probe or the reference and the signal right just to summarize like spectroscopy is a powerful tool uh, to study various processes inside a molecule or solid state sample we study reflection transmission absorption and em emission spectra in addition like we study their variation in time to study their dynamics uh, which electrons cannot detect okay so the ultrafast spectroscopy is useful where electronic present day electronics uh, fails okay. so we make you make use of these nonlinear properties of material to study um, various material properties like right? how light interacts with matter so thank you so this is my Uh, email id and our uh, lab web page if you have any questions which you uh, will not be able to ask today or tomorrow you may please write down any time uh, to my email id thank you come 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 <laughs> come 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 pakda mujhe pakda mujhe थैंक यू सर थैंक यू डॉक्टर गोपाल फॉर हैविंग सच एन इंटेलेक्चुअल एंड एनलाइटनिंग टॉक आई होप स्टूडेंट हैव लर्न अ लॉट एंड हैव अ ग्रेट अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ स्पेक्ट्रोसोफिटेक्स डेयर गर्ल्स 
you are fortunate that today you got an opportunity to interact with an eminent scientist of national and international repute we all know tata institute of fundamental research is the one of the outstanding research institutes in india that is dedicated to basic research in mathematics and sciences its base is located in mumbai with centers at pune bengaluru and hyderabad students tomorrow you will get an opportunity to have a virtual tour to spectroscope lab of tata institute of fundamental research mumbai where you will learn deflection transmission measurements cryostat on prop measurement and many more and i hope that such research exposure at undergrad level will help you to plan your future in the right way once again lots of thanks to the today's speaker dr venugopal my sincere thanks to all the participants of our institute as well as from other institutes of ludhiana for gracing the occasion thank you to all and hope to meet you tomorrow at 12 pm thank you dr gopal once again for thank you ma'am thank you accepting our invitation and gracing our occasion yeah. thank you ma'am thank you sir hope to meet you again at 12 pm tomorrow tomorrow yes ma'am so i'll i'll show them about uh, the simple transmission reflection setup using a home built one with a few thousand rupees and then go on to complicated setups where we do time resolve measurements near fields and uh, single photon detection and things like that. okay right sir right. thank you very really fortunate thank you sir thank you well, thanks a lot to everyone Hope if to there are any follow. questions like uh, please feel free to write to me and yes. i'll be uh, answering them well even uh, if you have uh, just now any question you can ask is there anyone or you can write your queries at the address that dr gopal has shared at his mail id showing on the screen so hope to end this all with all the gratitude towards our dr gopal thank you sir thank you ma'am bye okay bye bye Have a nice day. Bye.